This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So how copyrightable is a character? If you make a character for your story or movie or video game or TV show, and then someone else makes a similar character, where is the line where that becomes copyright infringement and therefore illegal? Well, that's the question that Clayton Haugen asks in his lawsuit against Activision Publishing, Activision Blizzard, Infinity Ward, and Major League Gaming. Clayton Haugen brings this action as the owner of copyrights in two literary works and 22 photographs based on a character that he created named Cade Janis. Haugen wrote November Renaissance, a story set in the near future. A central character in November Renaissance is Cade Janis, a female vigilante and pariah figure. Haugen created this distinct and multidimensional female protagonist for his story because he believed that November Renaissance could be a successful film, and the unique female lead would distinguish it from an oversaturated market of action and science fiction movies. Now, I'm already hearing echoes of the Tardigrades lawsuit, so I'll put a bubble here in the YouTube video and you can go back and watch some of that for some more details on what happened in that similar situation. Anas Abdeen in the Tardigrades lawsuit had created really only a basic concept or basic treatment, not even a finished final story with a fully fleshed out set of characters. So what we're going to be looking for in here is how detailed is this Cade Genis character? Some concepts to think about are that the human body itself really isn't copyrightable. You have two arms, you have two legs, you have a face, and you have a look to you. You can't say that because someone else made a character that has a face and two arms and two legs that that's copyrightable. But the details of a character, the exact expression of that character is copyrightable. The backstory of Sherlock Holmes, for example, is what makes Sherlock Holmes a copyrightable character. If someone else comes along and makes a detective figure who wears a deerstalker hat, but is otherwise dissimilar to Sherlock Holmes, that's not going to be copyright infringement. You have to be substantially similar, and you have to be substantially similar in protectable elements. So let's take a look here to see what all those connections are and see if this convinces us this is a civil lawsuit, so it would be a preponderance of the evidence standard. They just have to convince the judge. Based on these allegations, if the plaintiff is able to prove what they say they have here, is it going to be convincing enough to overcome the defense's rebuttal and convince the judge to find in favor of the plaintiff? Haugen created photographs of the Cade Janis character so that he could present November Renaissance to film studios. He recruited talent to be the closest representation of how he wanted to portray his Cade Janis character. I'm sorry, I don't know if it's Janis or Jadis, so I'm going to pronounce it Janis and I'm sorry if it's wrong. In the film and television industry, the talent portrays a character in an artistic narrative creative work. In a series of sessions beginning in 2017, he photographed the talent as Cade Janis. Haugen presented his story and the photographs to many film studios. He also published the Cade Janis photographs on his website, on Instagram, and in a series of calendars. So the second part of substantial similarity in copyright infringement is whether the defendant had access to the copyrighted work. So just because it's substantially similar doesn't mean it's copyright infringement unless there's also access to the copyrighted work. So now he's saying he published the photographs to his website, Instagram, and on calendars. And so then we're going to need to find out whether Activision had access to those or not. Defendants produce and market Call of Duty video games. In recent years, they realized that they needed more diverse game characters to reflect the makeup of the modern population. They wanted a strong, skilled female fighter. They found this character in Haugen's Cade Janis. Their copying of Haugen's character was deliberate, intentional, and comprehensive. Defendants, through contractors they directed, used Haugen's Cade Genis photographs as guides for how to frame their own imaging and photographs, hired the same talent who had posed for Haugen's Cade Genis photographs. So they're saying they hired the same woman, the same actor, actress, to, to pose for the photographs. 
asked the talent to ask Haugen for the same clothing and gear. Okay, same clothing and gear that she wore when he created the Cade Janus photographs. Hired the same makeup professional who prepared the talent for Haugen's Cade Janus photographs. Directed her to do the talent's makeup exactly as she had for Haugen's Cade Janus photographs. Directed her to style the talent's hair exactly as she had for Haugen's Cade Janus photographs. Even using the same hair piece extension. And then photographed and three dimensionally scanned the talent using Haugen's K. Janus photographs as a guide. Do you remember we had the Disney issue or the Pixar issue with the unicorn on the side of the purple van? I forget what movie that was from, but if I remember, I'll put a bubble up here. And that probably wasn't enough for substantial similarity because they changed things. It wasn't an exact or even substantially similar copy. So the underlying concept isn't protectable, it's only the actual expression fixed in a tangible medium that is protectable by copyright. And then, even when fixed, only the protectable elements, which is a legal question about what is protectable under copyright, only certain things are protectable. Like I said, the human body itself is not protectable. So you have to have all those things, and if you don't have all those things, then it's not copyright infringement. Defendants used these infringing photographs and three-dimensional images to develop the animated in-game character Mara for Call of Duty Modern Warfare and used additional photographs of Mara to market the game. With this infringing female character as the centerpiece of an advertising campaign for the first time in the Call of Duty series, they shattered all previous sales and games played records. Call of Duty Modern Warfare has generated more than a billion dollars in revenue. Plaintiff Clayton Haugen is a writer, photographer, and videographer. His story, Hard Kill, was released in August 2020 as a full-length feature film starring Bruce Willis. His photography and other works are centered on dystopian science fiction, post-apocalyptic, and military themes. He wrote, November Renaissance, a story set in the near future where Regulus Corporation has monopolized the process of human augmentation. We have a lot of stories about near future, human augmentation, big corporations. None of that's copyrightable by itself. You must flesh out your expression of those concepts, and that would be more likely to be copyrightable. This technology allows human brain to interface with computer systems, etc., etc. Kay Janis is an athletic vigilante and paramilitary figure. Her father, Frank Janis, was identical in nature. After uncovering the conspiracy of a non-human intelligence conducting the affairs of the world's most powerful technology corporation, Frank organized and led an underground group of ex-military personnel to stop Regulus. Again, these sort of vigilante stories of fighting the big corporation, that all by itself is not copyrightable. It's the names and the choices and the expression that's copyrightable. Kay Janis is the central character in November Renaissance. While she appears as a seasoned guerrilla-style fighter, she is not without a resonance of duality and hidden layers. Haugen carefully delineated her as more than a stock action hero. She is characterized as a relatable figure who embodies a sense of human vulnerability and flaw. She feels guilt that she did not do enough to vindicate her father's legacy, and other characters have similar regrets that they did not live up to their parents' ideals. Again, the concept of everyone struggles to live up to their parents' ideals is not copyrightable. Only their particular expression in detail would be protectable. So we need to see what detail Haugen gave to Janice's struggle to live up to her parents' ideals. To present or pitch November Renaissance to film studios, Haugen needed concept art. He found a talent to portray his conception of Cade Janus. In a series of sessions beginning in 2017, he photographed the talent as Cade Janus. He provided her with clothing and props, including weapons. He hired a professional to do the talent's makeup and style her hair. He chose the settings. He directed the talent in her poses and facial expressions. He made the creative decisions as a photographer about camera angle, color, definition, lighting, and shadow. Shadows. In many of these creative decisions, Haugen put his K. Janus character into a tangible form. He brought this character he had envisioned to life so that his audience could not only see her but also understand and relate to her experience. The Copyright Office has issued a registration certificate, and he lists all of that here. For the sake of keeping the story short, I want to get to this part. Haugen presented his story and photographs to many film studios. He published the photographs, as we said before. 
defendants copied his photographs without his knowledge or permission. The photograph titled K Genis 16 with a file titled DSC 9470 JPEG was used by defendants in the development of their Call of Duty Black Ops 4 game. In a development project called Project Odyssey dated September 18th, 2017, defendants included a copy of Haugen's K Genis 16 photograph on the casting page page 7, under the heading, The Face of the Near Future. And you can see here, I'll zoom in, it does look like this photograph sits right here in an exact duplicate, a bit-for-bit -bit copy. The Project Odyssey document establishes that defendants had access to Haugen's K. Genis photographs and his K. Genis character, at least as of September 2017. The Project Odyssey document described defendants' casting goal. Our casting should be reflective of the makeup of the modern population. The Call of Duty games needed more diverse characters. The next game was Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Uh, yeah, he said this already. Infinity Ward contacted the same talent Haugen had cast for his Kate Janis photographs. They hired her to pose for photographs and three-dimensional scanning that they would use to develop the animated in-game character named Mara and also to market the game. In this process, Infinity Ward and its contractors used Haugen's K. Genis photographs as a guide and at one point post them on the wall of the studio. I mean, this is much closer than the Tardigrade case. The Tardigrade case didn't have anybody deliberately, allegedly, I mean, I mean I'm sure that Nasabdin alleged it, but didn't have evidence of actual copying. This has evidence of actual copying of the photographs in order to guide them to the final character. So there's at least evidence of access. The photograph copying might be some kind of basic copyright infringement, but I don't think they used those photographs in the end game. They may have used them privately to sort of guide what they wanted the character to look like. If I went and cut out various characters from different magazines and comic books and and screenshots of movies and, and video games, and, and I posted them all on a collage on the wall, and I said, okay, I want my character to be kind of like that, and then I made my own character from that, that wouldn't necessarily be copyright infringement. It could reach the level, though. We're, we're like right there on the threshold, in my humble opinion. In addition to hiring the same talent, they hired the same makeup professional, asked them to make the talent exactly as she had done for Haugen's Kate Janis photographs, style her hair exactly the same way, using the same hairpiece extension, provided the talent with military style clothing similar to what Haugen provided to her from his wardrobe. I'm not sure that providing the same military style clothing would be copyright infringement. I'm pretty sure that that's going to be Senna Fair or basic unprotectable elements that people wearing military style clothing is not something that any one person owns. But collectively, in total, taking the whole thing together, yeah, maybe it reaches some level of copyrightability that could be then infringed. One contractor that defendants hired did not have female technical clothing. They asked the talent to try to get Haugen to lend her the same clothing and props from his K. Janis photographs. To conceal their planned infringement, defendants required the talent and makeup professional to sign non-disclosure agreements. The result was an animated character and a set of photographs that were intended to be and were copies of Haugen's K. Janis photographs. And now we're getting a little bit farther from it. He's not saying that the Call of Duty Mara character had the same struggle with her parents' expectations. Not saying that she wore the Sherlock Holmes, metaphorically speaking, wore the same hat and wore, you know smoked the same pipe and and expressed the same backstory. They're saying they made a character that looked like his character. And now we're moving back farther away from copyright infringement. The Mara character is a skilled female fighter, unprotectable, like the character that Haugen described. The Mara character is substantially similar, that's a conclusion. The defendants infringe, that's a conclusion. The following side-by-side -side example illustrates. Okay, what's protectable in here? It's a military-style person. 
Okay, they definitely chose someone who had similar hairstyle, but a hairstyle is not going to be a protectable copyrighted element. They're both carrying a rifle. That's not going to be protectable. They're both wearing tight-fitting turtlenecks. They're not, that's not copyrightable. They're wearing military BDUs on the bottom. That's not protectable. They're wearing gloves. That's not protectable. They're wearing a molly vest. That's not protectable. None of this is protectable. Maybe a judge could say overall there was some actual copying and that is protectable, but I'm not sure that they, that they, the defendants ever published the copied photograph. More images showing the similarity between Haugen's K. Genis photographs and defendants' in-game character copies. So K. Genis up top, and then on the right, Mara. Again, not... Yes, yes, I agree that they are similar. They are even substantially similar, but you don't get copyright protection in these elements. First, I think this is a bullpup rifle on the right, and it's a traditional rifle on the left. Oh, she is. She does have a bullpup on the on the J the K Genesis eight photo. But again, the rifle is not a protectable element. The military dress is not a protectable element. The fact that K Genesis eight has a scarf of sorts and Mara has a scarf does not mean it's a protectable element. The tattoos on the arm, that might be a protectable element, but those tattoos aren't so well defined for me to be able to tell if they are a copy or not. Here's more Cade Genis on the left and Mara on the right. It's a Caucasian woman with dark hair with her long hair flowing across her forehead to one direction. That is not a copyrightable element. The tattoos are covered up in the Mara in-game character photo to the right. Here we have both characters aiming down sights. That's not a copyrightable element. There, you cannot copyright woman aiming rifle down sights in military garb. That's not what we protect in copyright. Here's another side-by-side -side example. The one in the cloak on the left Bullpup rifle on the right, traditional AK style on the left. These are not copyrightable things. Again, actual copying, probably some kind of infringement. But yeah, I'm not sure that there's enough character development here to say that these are copyright infringements of one another. Here's another screenshot on the left versus the right. I mean, I mean, do do the game of hyperbole with me. They both have noses. Is that copyright infringement? No. They both have faces. Is that copyright infringement? No. They both have heads. Is that copyright infringement? No. The, they, they both have hair, that the same color hair. They both have eyes. You know, when you put it all together, it doesn't make it any more copyrightable. You have to develop more detail than just saying, we both have female protagonists. Here's another one. They're both squinting with that cool look, that tactic cool look that we see from characters who are trying to be engaging in stories. That doesn't mean you've got anything copyrightable. Cade Janis on the left wearing earphones. The one on the right isn't wearing earphones. It doesn't matter. None of that is copyrightable. Then they use one of their defendants' photographs to market the game. Great. That doesn't mean any copyright infringement was committed. But here's the evidence that the character was used in the game. Great. Okay? The character was used in the game. Got it. If they used Clayton Haugen's photo, if that's Clayton Haugen's photo, then yeah, that's copyright infringement. I doubt that these are the photos that Clayton Haugen made, but rather the defendants allegedly used Clayton Haugen's character as inspiration for their character. That's not automatically copyright infringement.
But I could hear the argument. I can definitely hear, and there will definitely be people in the comments who are like, those two look the same. It's copyright infringement. You, you have to go beyond whether they are just substantially similar. It has to be substantial similarity and access in protectable elements. And what we don't hear about in copyright law enough is that only some things are protectable. The stolen Mara character was the first female character the defendants had featured. That's not copyrightable. Defendants released the game and they profited. Great. That's not a copyright violation. Haugen never authorized defendants to make copies of his works. Okay, if they made copies of his works, great. He's saying that Mara is a derivative of Janus. If he can prove that, great, that's copyright infringement, but I don't know that he's shown that yet. Defendants have infringed. They made copies of the Renaissance works. Okay, great. If, if they bought a copy of his book and, and then they made copies of that book and circulated amongst the team, that's copyright infringement. If they made copies of his photographs, bought a copy and then made copies to circulate amongst the team, that's probably copyright infringement. If they made derivatives, that's copyright infringement, but he has to prove that. If they distributed his character, yes, that would be copyright infringement. But hear me out here. If they took Janus' photograph, put that in the game, and put that in the marketing materials, that's clearly copyright infringement. But making a character that looks similar, that's not copyright infringement. And I haven't seen any, anything in here that the Mara character in Modern Warfare had a backstory or character development or plot or plot arc or themes that copied Haugen's Janus character. So really we're just saying that one character copied the look of another character. And that's really thin copyright protection. You don't really get copy protection on a character's look all by itself, if you're just talking about a human person. Now, sure, you can draw a, you know, we're, we're watching Rick and Morty again. So you can draw Rick and Morty. That's protectable. If I go and draw Rick and Morty, but give them a different backstory, that's copyright infringement. Like the Dr. Seuss and Star Trek mashup, Oh, the Places You'll Boldly Go. That's copyright infringement, according to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Still have to finish that, that story, so I don't have a bubble here for you yet. These infringements have resulted in more than a billion dollars in sales of infringing copies of Haugen's works. So he then goes into the copyright infringement, cause of action, direct financial interest. Yeah, I, I agree. If he has proven that that's copyright infringement, then he gets copyright damages. Sure. And he asks for a jury demand. I'm not sure that a jury actually helps him here because the jury would still have to be instructed by the court in what we call jury instructions. And so the court is going to have to rule on what the jury is even looking for. And there are lots of steps along the way. I think we saw the uh, there, were, there was a test, uh, the internal and external test. Um, and I, I forget if that applies in the in this this court here. What court are we even in? We're in the Eastern District of Texas. So I don't even know if that applies here in the Eastern District of Texas. But the jury will have limited findings to make. So I'm not, uh, it didn't convince me. I, but it, there's still there's room for argument here. Obviously, the plaintiff has made their best case. The summons was only issued on February 4th. So once the summons is served on the defendants, they will each have 21 days to respond. Or maybe they will have signed a waiver of service and have 60 days to respond. And I expect that there will be a motion to dismiss claiming that this doesn't state a claim upon which relief can be granted because there is no copyright claim and therefore no relief from a court. So that would be a federal rule of civil procedure 12b6 motion to dismiss. That's what I expect we'll see here. Whether the judge will grant it or not, I don't know. If the judge agrees that there's anything here that could be proven later in court in a summary judgment motion or in discovery or before a judge in a bench trial or a jury in a jury trial, uh, then maybe it survives a motion to dismiss. But I think there's just just going on on a limb here, I think there's not enough here to show copyright protection for the Cade Genis character. Maybe there's enough to show that there was some underlying infringement, not in the published version of Modern Warfare, but maybe in its creation, that 
there was some copying of a photograph or something. And that would get probably minimal damages, $750 per title, $2,250 when you multiply it by three for willfulness. So I doubt that there's much here. Uh, and maybe the parties will reach some kind of agreement. But if Mr. Haugen has a if he's motivated by the lucrativeness of the of the potential award, uh, maybe he won't agree to a small damage award. So yeah, I, I don't I don't know what's going to happen with this, but my guess is that it will not survive a motion to dismiss. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education channel here on YouTube. You can also find us on Floatplane and on twitch.tv slash lawfulmasses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Our channel is community supported by your monthly financial contributions on patreon.com slash ljfrench, sponsus.com slash law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Thank you to the following $50 plus supporters in the month of February. Joe Tyson, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Spirit Bear, Andy, Benjamin Hytoff, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Rudolph Bescherer Jr., Oscar the Prophet, Brandon Abel, Torpedon, Sovereign Titison, Shadow Tycho, Earthbound Star, RDH Dragon, Nathan McCarty, and Winter Grill. And thank you as well to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on your screen. I hope everyone has a great week. I will see you in the videos that drop. I love you all. Bye.